Geschichte unseres Volkes wird ein Reich gebaut aufgrund des Willens des Volkes selbst. Die große Zeit ist jetzt angebrochen. Deutschland ist nun erwacht. Sein und dann wird den Juden das freche Lügenmaul gestoppt werden. Den Felden fest. Überzeugung, dass eben doch das Eimer der Sturm gekommen ist. Es ist eine kleine, wurzellose, internationale Clique. Es sind die Einzigen. Sollen die Vermittlung der jüdischen Rasse in Europa. In 1939, the Germans invaded Poland. The Germans came and everything that we knew changed over. They made us wear yellow stars. That was a new edict of the government that Jews couldn't be doctors, as well as lawyers and teachers, other professions. The stores uh, owned by Jewish merchants uh, were suddenly in jeopardy. It was terrible. Synagogues were burned, homes were destroyed. I was about seven, eight years old when the um, uh, Nazis came in the house and my mother said, we are Jewish, and they started looting the business. They came through our house and we had to run through the back door. My mother's parents said, we want you to go to Warsaw because it'll be better there. They created ghettos in different larger cities, and they brought people from the small towns into the larger ghettos. In the large ghetto was a famine. They furnished a ration twice a month. A lot of people ate that meager ration in three days. What did they do the rest of the day? The only thing was free is water. And people drink a lot of water and they swell up and died in the street. Most people who died in the ghetto, they didn't die from the Nazis shooting them or something like that. They, uh, desired, they died from uh, starvation, they died from disease, and just total neglect. They started taking people for work, came to Dvorak, and they realized that there was Jews in town. They surrounded, surrounded the ghetto and killed everybody. And that was the f one of the first times that they started using gas instead of shooting people with bullets. When they did not have ammunition, they put the Jews in Bucharest in uh, slaughter home, like slaughterhouses, like animals on the hooks. The Jews were marched from their town to the next town, and they got more Jews. And then they moved to the next town, and they got more Jews. And they kept going and going until they were put into labor camps. They uh, called all the Jews and said, tomorrow morning, you have to leave. So we uh, left in a big column, all the Jews uh, in a convoy. They loaded us in cattle cars. The cattle cars were closed, like sardines, one next to the other. The only thing we'd see for air was a little window up on the top with bar joists. She spent 11 days on one with, as she describes, three slices of bread and no water. People were dropping like flies. There was no place to put them. You just had to stand on the bodies. The Nazis shipped us. I went to Auschwitz and to Dachau. My mother was in the Warsaw Ghetto till the end. She was active in the uprising, working as a courier, but she was eventually captured and sent to a camp Right away, there were separated men, separated women, separated people uh, with small children. We worked, it was hunger, people died. My dad was in Plaschow, which was from Schindler's List, and uh, Treblinka, Auschwitz. My father spent terrible days um, in the concentration camps. He was labeled B-15-16. Uh, one of my daughters was little. She used to say, my papa was coolie as a tattoo on his arm until she 
later on found out what that was from. My mother's name was Eleanor Ehrlich. She preferred her nickname of Dickie Ehrlich. Uh, the Germans, though, knew her as 81820, which was the tattoo that they had given her when she first entered the camps. She was put to, into a work camp uh, for the Phillips Company making uh, radio tubes that were going into V-2 rockets. The uh, slave labor in those camps uh, prided themselves on sabotaging as much of those tubes as they possibly can, could without getting caught. My father grew up working with his hands, and that's part of how he survived. He told me a story one day where they said, you know, does anybody know how to work on aircraft engines? And he said, sure, yeah, I do. Of course, he didn't, but he figured he could learn it pretty quick. Her father was killed in the gas chamber, and the day he was gassed, she could notice this unusual odor in the air. And a few hours later, a guard came to her with her father's ashes in a cigar box, wanting to sell those ashes. They liquidated, they killed 11 million people, innocent people. I had five brothers and four sisters. And in 1945, I was the only one survivor of an immediate family of 11 people. And my father was one of ten, 10 siblings, and only him and a brother and sister survived. My mother was one of five, and a brother and a sister of hers survived, too, and they end up in Israel. There were 65 family members when the war started. When the war was over, they were very fortunate there were still 63 of them alive. A soldier with a pelerin came into the camp and started screaming in Yiddish. You're then fry. You are free. She uh, is liberated by the Swedish Red Cross. Uh, she weighed all of 88 pounds at the end of the war at that particular time. The Russians came and liberated us in August of 1944. The, st the war was still going on. The Russians drafted all the partisans into the Red Army and marched them off to the front. Half of those who survived the war didn't survive the Russian army. And our soldiers rotten back and forth, back and forth with a rifle. So we raised our hand over there, we dragged ourselves across the road, and the soldier fought to us, let your hands down, let your hands down. Well, what the hands down, then when he turns around back and forth, I notice on his lap over here that <laughs> every time I think about it, I know this American insignia, and I knew then I was freed by the American. Well, there's no way to describe it, how we felt. We felt we are liberated. What was waiting us, we didn't know. Everyone after the war would go back to your small town to see who survived. And then they sent me home. There was no home to go to. When we returned, everything was looted. All the houses were destroyed. People from nearby villages came and took out everything. But we came home. And then we started a new life, thinking that we are going to be living in a free country. Unfortunately, the communists took over. Polish underground dissenters came into our apartment, lined us up against the wall, shot over our heads, and said, Jidi do Palestini, means Jews go to Palestine. The United uh, Nations Relief Agency that dealt with uh, the big question, what are we gonna do with the survivors of the concentration camps now that, that the camps are being liquidated? They went to the Federation office. That day, they put them on a train to Vienna. They lived in this school, in this displaced persons camp, which was the school for about five years. And we, we always thought that when we heard the term DP camp, we envisioned tents and, you know, sparse land. Apparently, they, you know, put 40 people in one room and 30 people in another, and they just held them there until the families could get out or figure out where they were going to next. People trying to 
make a family again. They didn't have a family. DP camp was big on training the survivors on skills, like how to, how to be printers, how to uh, repair gasoline engines. In the displacement camp, they had nothing. And so what they did, their friends in the uh, barracks took the curtains down, and they were, my mom said, horrendous looking curtains. And she made a dress for herself, and they put curtains over a box, and they all put their food rations together and made a meal. And a rabbi in the uh, barracks married them. My grandfather you know, tried just selling anything he could to make some money doing anything he could. He did trade on the black market in Vienna as well. They had to make money. He would buy it for 10 lei and he would sell oil for 20 lei. He would buy cigarettes, he would sell cigarettes. Whatever he could do um, to get money. We had two small children. As soon as we had the children, we realized that remaining in Romania, it's a dead end. And we have to do everything possible to leave the country and give a chance to the children, and of course to us, to live in, a free, in the free world. And come about the early 50s, I believe my mother said to my dad, you know, Europe isn't the place for us. There are too many bad things that happen to Jews here, and I don't think we should stay here. And their biggest fear was that they weren't going to get to America or to Israel or to anyone else and that they were gonna to have to live in the country or around the country of where they had just been abused so badly and lost all their family. My grandmother before the war lived in Palestine. She lived in Jerusalem. I wanted to go to Jerusalem, nothing. But the English then did not let the Jews in, no country let the Jews in. It became illegal to get out of the country, so at the first opportunity to get out of the country, we did it for our children. My father stayed at the camp, and then he wanted to come to the, to the United States. At that time, the uh, immigration quotas were very strict uh, for European Jews wanting to come into America. The floodgates didn't open right after World War II, like I think a lot of people believe. From 1924 until uh, the late 1940s, um, we had a system that was a reaction. It was a really an anti-immigrant reaction. It essentially ended most Jewish and Italian immigration to the U.S. Those quotas were still in effect uh, after the war. During the 1930s, it's the reason why most Jews weren't able to get visas to come to the United States. And even after the war, when people were desperate to get to the United States, there was worry that uh, Jewish immigrants were spies. And that was a reason that was offered fairly frequently by members of Congress of why they were not going to open the doors. One morning, I see a registration on the United Nations Relief Fund. I said, what's going on over here? What's the registration about? He said, they register people to go to America. I register, I go home, I tell my wife, we go into America. <laughs> what do you got in America? You don't have nobody in America. She had an aunt who had immigrated to the U.S. before the war. She contacted her aunt, and um, her aunt agreed to sponsor her. Her aunt had to prove what her net worth was, that my mother would have a job when she got there, all those kinds of things. But unlike some of these other folks that came to Memphis, she went to Atlanta. I got a letter from America. A lady who I thought was long time dead wrote to me and said, I am your Aunt Tilly. I will bring you to America. We went to Rome, where we waited for the American visa. In Italy, the organization named Hias took care of us. They gave us uh, a place where to stay and to, to be able to eat. We could not work. We had to be very, very careful with every penny that we spent because we did not have the money. In the Munich, they told me, you're going to Memphis. Memphis? Why Memphis? Never heard of it. Why Memphis? He said, you are a furniture finisher. And in Memphis is a furniture factory over here. So that's why they picked for me to come to Memphis. I go to a map, I look, I can't find, oh, I seen Memphis right here near the Mississippi. Oi, Mississippi, they picking cotton. What will I do over there? Well, in uh, America, I wanted to go to Chicago. I wanted to go to Hollywood, to go to New York. They picked Memphis for me. But 
to get out of Germany, I went. We were loaded on the General Taylor ship. We came by ship for two weeks to New Orleans. The seas were very rough and very few people came through New Orleans. Most of the boats that came through from Europe went to New York. And of course, first thing they saw was the Statue of Liberty. My mom said it was a beautiful feeling. She came with her brother, and uh, they came through Ellis Island. At Ellis Island, my mother got through. My uncle was not permitted to come to the United States, probably because he was a German with a Portuguese passport, and uh, he spoke seven languages. They didn't quite understand uh, uh, why he wanted to come to the United States. My parents, they made the journey across the, uh, the Atlantic. My mother, you could see she's really pregnant. My mother's real birthday is May 1st, but um, on her papers it said January 1st, and my father refused to let her change anything when they were going through all the naturalization things because he was afraid they wouldn't get to America. My mother says she kissed the ground she walked on, just kissed the ground as soon as she got here and just tried to have a positive feeling that this is America, this is a free country, and we're gonna be able to start all over and build a life. Well, the first thing I did was not to look back. I can't bring anything back again. I can only look to the future. And if this is a free country and it offers certain opportunities, I'm willing to take them. Would we have known how hard the beginning would be? We would have never made the journey. Thank God we did not know. We came with no language, with no friends. Finally, we came to Memphis. There's a guy from the Jewish family service waited for news. We go out, we're coming up from the train. So he greet us, hello. Well, I ask him in Yiddish. He said, don't talk Yiddish. I didn't know I'm coming to America. I didn't learn English. In the beginning, I felt like stupid. We stayed in the Hotel Tennessee for about a week. Then they moved us to an apartment. There was no bed where to sleep. So upstairs lived a, a couple, so, and they took us upstairs, they, called, they invited us, served us dinner. There were very nice people that did help them periodically, but when you grow up in a middle-class, upper-class families, had everything they wanted, lived a normal childhood. The war happens and then all of a sudden they come here with nothing um, and they have to start begging from strangers. They were totally humiliated. Mrs. Kelman would like a dollar to buy a blouse, or Mr. Kilman needs a dollar fifty to go buy a shirt so he can apply for a job. Chaim Katz, the uncle that brought my dad over, owned an auto parts place, so which was called Katz Brothers, and so he hired my dad to do manual labor. Over Katz Brothers, there was an attic converted kind of into a room, and that's where they first lived when they came up. When survivors or immigrants came here. The Jewish Family Service would send a, a social worker to try to help them adjust. The social worker, at the beginning of the process, was pretty negative on my father's reactions. The first day or two, here was my father. He was in his 30s. He was still a young man. He had all this responsibility. He had been through so much, and he had survived by his wits and by his skills and by just, you know, sheer luck. And here was this new phase of his life. And I think it was just very daunting to him. But then you start reading more and she totally flips around and starts to understand what is going on, what he's gone through and what he's going through. A couple of things that she did when she got here, one was, uh, um, was getting the tattoo that was on her arm removed. She did that almost immediately. She could not stand to see that number on her, right here on her arm. So she had plastic surgery and had that removed. She was an extrovert. Fitting in was, was not gonna be a problem for her. She just had a spirit about her that uh, people just loved. Most 
were shocked when she'd tell them about her Holocaust experience because her ac she had no accent. They thought she was from maybe South Georgia, but certainly not Berlin, Germany. Well, I know from my dad's perspective, um, he wanted to be an American. If you look at pictures uh, from when he was in high school, um, he, it looked, he looked like Elvis Presley. It was the 1950s. They had the, the hair with the, 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 the flippy thing. thing. My grandfather started working immediately. As a butcher. You know, they would work from 4 o'clock in the morning till 8 or 9 o'clock at night. My grandmother would go to school. Um, and then she would come home and teach my grandfather English. And it didn't work out so well. <laughs> His English was horrible. <laughs> I don't think my father was ever 100% comfortable with English, even though he had no problem talking to people and he would talk to anybody. Every day she would go um, to the English classes. She'd walk regardless of whether, what the weather was, and she'd walk to the classes and sit with others to learn to speak English. She'd speak to her neighbor in English and tried not to speak Polish at home. Uh, Baron Hirsch, Temple Israel, and tried to help these survivors and refugees become accustomed to American customs, Memphis customs. The ladies uh, got together and, and had cooking classes. Uh, the American women showed these uh, European women how we cook in America. They had social groups. My mother, being so young, she didn't have a mother to tell her what to do or how to do it. So everything for them was like a puzzle. But the biggest shock was that they had the mentality that everybody in America was like, okay, comfortably okay living, and to see there's still poor people, there's still people suffering, and it was sort of like an eye-opener. There was a lot of disappointment, you know, the, the uh, people who advertised kosher food was not kosher. Uh, everything was different, but, you know, you get used to. I got used to a lot worse things in the labor camp. I got used to a lot worse things in the, in the woods. In Poland, corn on the cob is only served to pigs. You would never eat corn on the cob at all. And just some of the adjustments, she said, they were all sitting and eating with their hands corn on the cob. And my dad and mom looked at each other like crazy Americans. Uncle Chaim in Yiddish told them, try it, you'll love it. And they took one bite, and she said after that, every day, they wanted corn on the cob. You know, that was the 50s and the early 60s. My, my mother rode the bus a lot. She, she had to sit in the front, and, and the African Americans had to sit in the back of the bus. And you saw a lot of that here, and I'm sure that reminded her of where she came from. And she and my dad both thought this was the land of the free. They were coming to America. And when they came and saw discrimination and saw what was happening to another people, they couldn't understand. She and my father went to try to buy a home in Atlanta, and they were refused to be sold a home in uh, two different neighborhoods because they were Jewish. Major shock for my mother. How could this be in the land of the free? In Atlanta, and I think it's roughly 1956, her synagogue, the temple, was dynamited. So can you imagine the thoughts going through a survivor's mind after coming out of Nazi Germany and occupied Holland and coming to the U.S. and waking up one morning and finding out that your synagogue was dynamited. Shortly after she and my dad arrived in Memphis, they were taking a Sunday drive and they were on Parkway near Poplar, the front of Morningside Drive. And she said there was a sign at the entrance to Morningside Drive and it said, no Negroes, Jews, and dogs allowed. And she said she remembered she turned to my father and she said, well, at least Hitler gave us eight years to get out. My mother didn't let that step in her way. She had decided that if she was going to be here, she was going to be an American, and she was going to be like the rest of the community. And I wasn't going to come to America and go to school. I didn't have any money. And I wasn't going to have anybody pay tuition for me. And finally, I agreed, I agreed to go to school because tuition was free. And that is the reason, but you say the most redeeming thing was the American educational system, as it was 50 years ago, not now. While I was going to Memphis State, the Korean War broke out. I reported for my draft notice and was sent in the United States Marine Corps. And I remember I was in the Marine Corps on my regular duty station, and one night I woke up, and I said, holy smoke, I had a dream. And the dream was in English. 
and that's when I knew I was American. My wife asked me, no, how does it go on at work? I said, I don't know. I'm working and the boss tell me I'm doing fine work. Comes Friday, he hand me $20. My tears come up, I said, $20? How will I lay, how will I survive $20? I thought, but soon rent, I got to pay that, I got to pay that. He said, oh, don't worry, don't worry. Sure enough, I quit this job to custom-made furniture because of the incident I had. I became a painter, contractor, made $42 a, a, a week. That wasn't good money. I had marbles. I had jingles in my pocket. I was a millionaire. Capitalist. I did emergency service every weekend. I was carrying a beeper. We did not meet any people our age for, for a good uh, part of our first few years because all that we did was work, and this was the beginning. We had those two salaries, and little by little, he found job. My mother started working until we all rented a house. It was very dirty. We, we scrapped and scrapped and scrapped and moved in. But we were happy that we could take, in the morning, I would take my mother-in-law to work, my wife to work, the children to school, and I will come home not with a car. I will take a bus because I was afraid it's too much gasoline that I'm going to spend and I didn't have the means. To walk. You see, mostly this was a three car. This is what the but car. But you bought a but first a car. I did buy a first car. After I already got my first marble, my first money. The first car when we bought, it was really, it made me feel independent. My dad, on his own, found a job um, at a at XL Smelting, at a smelting plant. He went from starting out working in the nasty, horrible conditions on up to being a um, the supervisor and he stayed there until he was in his 70s. They didn't live lavishly. They were always, I think probably like many people who have been through hardships, um, they were very conservative. You know, our grandfather kept money under the mattress. But yeah, Judaism was, was their whole life. You know, when they came to America, their best friends were all other survivors from Eastern Europe and they really formed their own shtetl here. All their friends, or close friends, were other survivors who had gone through similar experiences to them, had gone through similar losses to them. And they had a social club that kind of helped fill in those gaps. A lot of the families became very close. And they'd have dances together, and they'd have meetings together. We were there for each other for the good times, for the bad times, for the Jewish holidays, for weddings, for bar mitzvahs, for funerals. I remember when I was 10, I said, how come I don't have grandparents like everybody else? And I can see now as a parent how painful that must have been. She loved to have a house full of people in her home. I think that's what was stripped from her for all those years in Europe, that they weren't allowed to do that. There would be gatherings of, of, of other families where suddenly they're talking Yiddish or they're talking Polish, and, and I can only sense they're talking about uh, things that were. And uh, there was a feeling that they didn't really want to go out to the community and talk about these atrocities because a lot of, a lot of people here in the States they didn't want to hear about the atrocities of uh, Europe. When we started asking questions, my mother would immediately get up from the table and go in the kitchen. She didn't want to talk about it. And that's the thing is so many people, so many of these survivors held this in for so many years. They were just told to, you know, start a new life. Um, don't talk about it. Just, you know, push it in the back of your mind. We can read things in books and we can try to think of what it was like but to actually be there and to experience the smells, the sounds, uh, the stench of death, you really can't communicate that, what it's like. And the only people that really know what it's like is the people that have gone through it. But my mother, during the last few years of her life, talked about it a lot, you know, to us if we wanted to ask her, to her grandchildren. And she spoke uh, quite frequently at a number of schools uh, within the Mid-South area. Truthfully, it's not that I don't like, I mean, what's the point? You know, nobody wants to hear that, but I'm wrong. I, I have some non-Jewish 
friends who love to hear those stories. The entire attitude of the Romanian government of denying the Holocaust was making absolutely impossible to talk about the Holocaust. So as soon as we came, I enlisted my entire effort into the remembering movement to speak to churches, to colleges, to schools. People, the audience, young and old, are very receptive. Some of them did not hear about the Holocaust, did not realize the implication of the tragedy. Probably, I think, the greatest legacy of all the survivors and all the children is that we were not silent about the Holocaust. My grandfather says that at one time, um, he just, he kind of gave up, and he put my father down in a ditch and covered him up with his coat, and he laid down to sleep. And my father later describes it in his book that he slept for 40 years, meaning that he never spoke about it at all. He wanted to forget about it. It was a bad way to start his life, and he had a new life and became educated, gave back to the community, both Jewish and non-Jewish, and wanted to move forward. And that was the time when there were a lot of Holocaust deniers uh, that were really coming out in the, in the media around the country and around the world. He felt like he really had to just wake up and stand up and say, don't believe those people, I was there, believe me. She really fought for it to try to end illiteracy in Memphis. She uh, helped start the Memphis Literacy Council. President Bush assigned her the Thousand Points of Light, giving recognition to volunteers in each state of this country who were making it a huge difference. We became a team of always going together that I spoke first and then my mom would, would tell her story and I found it very cathartic for her because over the years as she began to do that, she began to identify more and felt that she really was doing something with a purpose by being able to tell her story to, to touch so many other people. For her it was people need to know what happened so it wouldn't ever happen again. She loved going to classes and she had a charm about her afterwards. You know, kids typically all wanted to hug her before they left. I think she always felt that once she got here and got into a great family and had a great family, that, that her legacy was to help others. Two great parents, uh, both of whom had a rich life and made the best in that rich by meaning um, joy and love and experience and they left a great legacy here in Memphis. My father understood human nature. He was a psychiatrist. He got it. Uh, he understood it far better than I ever would and far more tolerant. He believed in, he believed in the decency of people. In 1984, 40 Holocaust survivors went to Washington, D.C. for the first uh, ever gathering of the American Holocaust survivors which drew about 17,000 survivors to uh, D.C. That event uh, inspired the creation of the Tennessee State Holocaust Commission. We are an educational entity, and we strive to uh, offer teachers agendas on how to, how to teach the Holocaust. Many times, teachers who received award from the Tennessee Holocaust Commission for their work are continuing to do the job the work that I feel I wanted to do, but now they are contagiously continuing my work. I'm just in awe that despite what they went through, despite the, the battles to, to, to survive, to get over here, that they were able to raise a family. The most important thing in their lives uh, were their kids and their grandkids. They loved America. I mean, they loved Memphis. They were able to say what they wanted. They were able to practice their religion. They were able to have Passover. They were able to celebrate holidays without being discriminated against. They were free. They were free. She was very thankful to be able to build her life in America. America was extremely important to her. She put out an American flag in front of her house every day of her life. Uh, we've lived a beautiful life here in Memphis. I mean, we have synagogues, we have a Jewish community center, we have hospitals, we have universities. We fulfilled our dreams living in America. How proud we are of our children. 
We have five grandchildren that are all in college now. The oldest is in law school. So we feel that it was all, you know, all the hardship and everything that happened to us was worth. I have the opportunity to be a free man, to live in America. I've served for America. I want to live like one. I'm delighted to be, to be still alive. I'm 86 years old. I'm appreciative of the opportunity of being an American. I am, and that's it. And then I do the best I can. I life, like the life in America because this is a free country. You can do anything you are able to do you want to do. That I own nobody any money, and I own my own house, which I built myself. I don't know any other life, because I was 15 years old when my life stopped. I love we achieved. I have, thank God, a nice family. I got children, I got grandchildren, and I have great-grandchildren. This I never thought we would achieve that. I did not go speaking to school. I'm not a public speaker. I did other things. I got involved in the community. I was president of Hadassah. Now, I'm not a spring chicken, let's face it. I had a lot of miles on me. So hopefully I'll be able to live in peace. There will be no more wars in the world. But what I would like to say, if people should get involved and fight bigotry where they f see it, because other way it could happen anywhere, and we see it creeping all over the world, so that's m the most important thing, to be vigilant and not let it happen here.